I know we have this thing called the car show going on today, and I had the privilege of walking up and down New Door Plain and seeing all these cars, and I felt like I feel really cool after doing that. So I was thinking about maybe if you don't mind, I'm going to do the message with these on today. Okay, is this all right? Yeah. What do you think? I mean, you know, you just look at all these cars, and you just start feeling cool uh, walking up and down the lane. But I hope that uh, you were able to make it here securely, and that if you had to take, uh, use the golf cart, I was riding the golf cart earlier, man, that's really fun. We, we need to get one of those for the church, okay? But what a blessing to see so many people out, and I had the opportunity to do the invocation for uh, the opening ceremony, and... I was sharing how uh, we, we actually have the meetings for the car show here every Tuesday. And there's lots of places in the church where we could have held the meeting. But guess where I had the meeting? Right here at the altar with the tables, because I wanted everybody who came to have a good view of the cross who was coming in, because that's what it's all about. So even though I don't want to, I'm going to take these off, okay? But, but these are really cool. But you know what? I think I'm going to leave them on just for the first part. Uh, so, why don't you take out your teaching outlines as we're continuing our message series on Genuine. And, you know, looking at the car show and seeing all these amazing cars, uh, what we're seeing is actually the finished product of all the work that has been put in. You know, countless hours go into restoring vehicles, man hours, hunting down parts, matching colors. Um, and it's not even just the cosmetic, the appearances, the aesthetics of the vehicle. Uh, many of these cars need work on the engineering side, and that takes even more time. Some of these vehicles take years to restore. And so when we look at the car show, we look at the beauty of the cars, but there's a lot of work, and there's a word for that. It's called restoration. And car restoration is very popular today, perhaps more so than it's ever been before. But you know who is the originator of restoration? God Almighty. And when it comes to your life and my life, you don't want any gimmicks, you don't want any phony parts, you don't want somebody who's not qualified to give you the restoration you need. My friends, that's called religion. Religion has an inability in itself that it cannot restore your life. Only God can. Now, if you think about it, whether you're rich or poor, young or old, whether you've gone to church or this is your first time, everybody needs restoration. Just look at our lives. Over the course of time, uh, we have some wear and tear on our tires, don't we? Stress increases the mileage on our minds. That's why we want to go crazy half the time. And if you've lived long enough, you have your fair share of dents and dings. And some of us, because of bad choices, because of bad relationships, because of wasted time and bad pursuits, uh, we've had a few wrecks in our day. But thanks be to God, He is in the restoring business. He restores you and I. In fact, one of the beloved Psalms that you've heard of in Psalm 23, a Psalm that's been read at many funerals, by the way, it says in verse 3 of David's Psalm 23, He restoreth my soul. Only God could do that. Only God could take that which was ready for the scrap heap and restore you and put you in the car show. That's what God could do. And so I want to talk with you about genuine restoration. I want to tell you, uh, your enemies don't want you to hear this, including your arch enemy from hell, the devil. He don't want you to hear about restoration. He wants you to believe you belong right there in the junkyard. He wants you to believe you're a pile of scrap, that you've rusted out, that you've got too many wrecks, that you can't possibly be restored. Well, we have enough proof throughout the Bible that says otherwise. God is in the restoring business. And so I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. The context is such. After finishing the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus comes down from the mountain after that amazing teaching. And he's greeted by people, and one person in particular. Now, as he comes down the mount, what's going to take place is a series of restoring miracles. Uh, we're going to see the centurion come forward. Later on, we will see uh, about the hemorrhaging woman. 
we're going to read about how he has uh, command over the storm. And so in many ways, these miracles are authenticating his ability to do just what he has taught about that he could do, which is restore. And so these miracles are authenticating the fact of what's on his business card is true, is that he is every bit of the Messiah, the restoring Messiah that has been promised, that has come on the scene. And so as we come to Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, a certain type of restoration project that has never been done before is presented to Jesus, but no sweat, he's got it. Starting in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 8, it says, when he came down from the mountain, that's the Sermon on the Mount, great crowds followed him, and certainly they did because his popularity was beginning to swell. And it says, notice this, out of all the crowd, the Bible highlights this one particular person that came to him. It's significant then, it's significant now. It says, and behold, a leper came to him. Now, as we study leprosy, culturally, historically, medically, it's something obviously you didn't want to have. If you were a leper, you weren't getting invited to too many car show events, too many barbecues or opportunities to hang out and watch the football game later. Uh, you were an outcast socially, emotionally, and even spiritually. You were put outside the temple. You were put outside the community. You had a label upon you. And there was extensive information in the Bible about that as well as other religious documents known as the Talmud. Nevertheless, behold, a leper came to him and we're told, knelt before him. Notice his posture. Knelt before him, that being Jesus. And listen to his prayer. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me what? What does he ask for? You can make me clean. Not you can make me popular again. Not you can get me invited to the next family outing, although all that's important. You can make me clean. In other words, you can make me whole again. You can restore what has been lost because of this debilitating disease. Now, the, out of the four Gospels, three of them record this event. Dr. Luke, who's a doctor, tells us that he was full of leprosy. Now, as we study leprosy's diagnosis, historically speaking, if you got leprosy, you probably only lived at most another nine, maybe a decade, maybe 10 years. So Dr. Luke says he's full of leprosy, which medically speaking in the Greek language is communicating that he was at the end of that 10-year term. And think about what leprosy does to a person. It attacks the extremities because leprosy lives in the lukewarm parts of one's body. And so his fingertips by this point, based on Dr. Luke's diagnosis, have fallen off. Perhaps the tips of his ears have fallen off. Perhaps his toes have fallen off. His lips have been mangled. His head has swelled, looks like a lion. He is an outcast. You could smell him from probably a few dozen feet away if he was coming. Which makes me believe that as he entered this scene, the crowd parted like the Red Sea. People yelling as they were told to. There it goes, well, unclean, a leper, a leper. And as he approaches, he comes to Jesus. Jesus doesn't move because Jesus is not scared of any restoration project. He, it, nothing intimidates him. Nothing catches him off God because he's God. Because he knew this man would come at this moment. He knew this man would come to seek restoration. And it says, and behold, a leper came to him and he knelt before him. Notice the condition of how this man is. Not just physically. Notice spiritually. Now a biblical point emerges because you and I should desire such restoration. All throughout the Bible, we have this unmistakable promise that God restores. Even in judgment, we see in the book of Joel where God had to basically read the riot act of the people for, for being disobedient and rebellious Still, what did God promise in Joel chapter 2? In spite of all of your shenanigans, all of your wrecks, all of your dents and dings that have been self-inflicted, what did God still say? I will restore you. Because only He can. And so a biblical point emerges. We don't come to God based on our religious merit. Paul told us that. Because he gave us his testimony in Philippians 3, he talked about how he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. 
He talked about where the circumcision was. He talked about how he, he knew the scriptures, the Old Testament back and forth. But he says, I count all of that as what? Filthy rags. So it's not about our religion. It's not about all the things we've done. It's about what Christ has done. And this man, although he has been an outcast, inwardly, apparently, it's very clear that this man has been waiting for the Messiah. So a biblical point emerges if you and I want to seek restoration. It's this. Genuine restoration requires coming to Jesus with the right attitude. Can you say that with me? Genuine restoration requires coming to Jesus with the right attitude. We don't come loud and proud with all of our religious merits. We don't come going, God, here's half of me. Nobody restores half a car. You're going to restore a car. You wouldn't, you're not going to go down this lane right now. There's over 450 cars, by the way. You're not going to find one car where you see half of the car restored and the other one isn't. The other side isn't. They wouldn't bring that car to the car show. Nobody's going to restore half a car. And Jesus doesn't restore half a person. Because we must come with both feet in in faith to say, yes, God, I trust you. I'm coming with the right attitude. I'm not coming demanding it. Notice, he came expecting, but not demanding. That's the proper posture of faith. Expect God to do great things, but don't demand it. Now, there's a lot of theology out there that tells us, demand this, declare that, and th that is disrespectful to a sovereign God. He will work in his time. It's by his grace we're saved. And it's by His transforming grace we're restored, whether that's of a person or a problem. Nevertheless, this man came with the right attitude. Now go ahead in your notes and circle the word clean. It's where we get the word catharize. Catharizo in the Greek language. To, pu to purge, to remove, to restore, to clean. In other words, he came before Jesus and he said this in many ways like a, a really a pathetic prayer, meaning that he's at the end of his rope. Lord, if you are willing. So in other words, I know you can, but if it is your will, make me clean. That's why it's proper to pray that way. It's proper to ask God for the moon, but ask him if it's in your will. Because I know you can, but your will be done. Not my kingdom come, my will be done. No, your kingdom come. Your will be done. Because a lot of times I pray, and I can have sincere prayers, but it may not exactly be God's will. Now, it might be the right prayer, but the wrong time. It might be the wrong prayer, but the right time. And I want to be as close to the Spirit as possible. I want to be walking in this genuine restoration mentality so that God could work in my life and in my prayer life, and so I can pray for things expectingly, but not demandingly. Genuine restoration doesn't demand God of anything. We don't need to remind God to do something for us. He's not asleep at the wheel. That's why Psalm 121 says, uh, you know, I look to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the maker of heaven and earth, the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. So genuine restoration is all about God's grace. But there is a human part of it, and that human part is humility, is the right attitude before God. And we see that in other parts of the Bible. How many of you heard the story of Job? Does anybody want to be Job? I didn't think so. Job, what a torturous life he had. You might recall all of his children killed. The enemy, the devil, asked for permission to destroy Job. God said, you can't kill him. The enemy did everything, put him like an inch within his life. Took his children. Destroyed his business. And as I told you before, some people mockingly go, oh, the only thing that, that was left was his wife, because his wife was terrible. You know what? Put yourself in his wife's shoes. She lost all her children. How do you think she would feel? Nevertheless, Job went through all of this, but yet he still did not sin and curse God. He had these, if you want to call them, three friends that were basically nitpicking his life, telling him that 
there's something wrong with his life, and that's why God did this. Not the greatest advice. You don't really need those people around you when you lose children and you go through hardship. But we always have people like that. You know, those spiritual, you know, prognosticators and those spiritual forecasters and, you know, those Monday morning prophets. Well, those were the people that were supposedly helping Job. And instead of basically maybe getting physical with them and kicking them out, he didn't do it. And at the end of the story of Job, listen to what we hear about in Job 42.10. Listen to the story of restoration. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job, which means all that he had lost. His ten children in heaven now, but God gave him ten more. His business restored, his authority restored. And when he had prayed for his friends. So in other words, that word when is communicating after he had prayed for his friends. Notice God had the restoration waiting but the restoration, God could do it, but the restoration was waiting on that full expression of humility which Job had. And God restored everything, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had had. What does that tell you and I? You're going to have people problems in your life. You're going to have people who unjustly come and point their judgmental finger in your life that does not give you a blank check and me a blank check to do whatever we want. We want to keep praying for our enemies and pray for those who oppose us because that begets, that welcomes God's restoration in our life as what was seen with Job. Because take this another route. What if Job was hypocritical? What if Job was phony in his faith? There's lots of people like that. Churches are filled with hypocrites. Why? Because the component, if it's genuine restoration, it, you, you need to treat people right. You can't treat people right and then ask for God to restore you. Those two prayers don't go together. Job treated even people who pushed his buttons right. And that invites God's restoration. Because if the whole discussion, the whole argument here is what? We're making a case for what? A genuine believer. You can't divorce how we treat people from that equation. It's a part of the numbers. It's a part of the process and Job was restored. And then also look to how we relate to God. So restoration is key if we're treating people right. But then if we get right with God. Of course, you've heard of the story of King David. In his leadership as king of Israel, the greatest king that Israel had ever seen at that point, he expanded the borders. He built the military. Economically, they were flourishing. He was at the top of his life, the top of his political career. He fell with Bathsheba. He was confronted by his friend Nathan. And then David wrote his confession psalm, Psalm 51, that night. But listen to what he says in Psalm 51, 12. Why don't we say it together? Another verse to commit to memory together. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. You want to pray for restoration. All of us are going to fall. All of us are going to sin, myself included. And when we do, God's grace will remind us what we need to do, which is come to Him in confession and repentance. And a proper prayer is not, God, I'm going to try to be good for the next seven days or from now till Christmas and now till Easter. Oh, it was a really bad year. I'll be good for a year. No, throw all of those religious gimmicks away. God wants you to come to Him in humility with repentance and confession and pray this prayer, Lord, restore to me the joy of walking in peace with You. The joy of Your mercy. The joy of Your grace. The joy of Your forgiveness. Why? Because that is what brings genuine restoration. That is what's going to put you back together. Even though you've rusted out. Even though you've become a pile of junk and I've become a pile of junk by way of my actions. God Almighty is in the restoring business and we want to come to Him and say, Lord, restore me. Put me in the car, show God. Use me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Because genuine restoration requires coming to God with the right attitude. And so I ask you this question before we move forward. What's your attitude today? Is your attitude, God, I'm going to do what I want. God, I got it my way. God, I'll just call on you when I need you. Uh, God, just, you know, buff this out and buff and, and you know, why don't you smooth this out so I can look good? God isn't just looking for appearances. Because these cars, they all drove here, by the way, so mechanically they had to get here. And God just doesn't want you looking good on the outside for religious purposes. He wants you to be clean under the hood as well, which is your heart. And that happens by way of genuine restoration. 
by coming to God and having the right attitude. Remember what the scripture says. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God wants to bless you with more grace because the only way you and I transform is by his grace. His transforming grace. And God is waiting to get our attention. You know, some of us, you know, what is it going to take? Another wreck? What what is it going to take? Another flat tire for God to get our attention? You know, God wants you to know right now that He loves you, that He cares for you, that He is in the car restoring business of your life. But come to Him with the right attitude. Write the second principle down. Genuine restoration results from Jesus' finishing ability. Genuine restoration results from Jesus' finishing ability. Can you say that with me? Genuine restoration results from Jesus's... Again, Jesus doesn't do any projects in my life and in your life half-heartedly on his end. What did Paul say in Philippians 1, verse 6? He who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion. You and I are a work in progress. We're in God's garage called the church right now. And God is working on me and he's working on you. Now, thankfully, the leper, I would imagine he had to follow that which was prescribed in the Old Testament. Now, when you study the Old Testament, the law for that matter, which is the first five books of the Bible, for those of you new to the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Every 39 letters in Genesis and Numbers, every, every letter, every fifth letter spells the word Torah. It's interesting when you get to Leviticus. The same could be said if you work your way from the back of Deuteronomy all the way to Leviticus. So it seems like everything, because where is the law prescribed in the book of Leviticus? So the first two books of the Bible and then four and five are pointing to Leviticus. Now, Leviticus has 26 chapters. What's in, the middle, what's in the middle of the book of Leviticus? A teaching on what? The most extensive teaching in Israel's history, by the way, not just the Bible. In what? Of leprosy. That's right, some of you said it. So, so right in the middle of the law. So the Torah, is po- it's pointing to this chapter, going and coming back. And it's pointing to Leviticus 13 and 14, the most extensive discussion on leprosy. The first miracle on record after he gets off the mountain of healing is what? Leprosy. Now, it's not just about physical leprosy because leprosy is a picture of sin. It's a picture of ultimate need for restoration. Are you with me so far? And so genuine restoration then results from Jesus' finishing ability because the Messiah in the book of Leviticus, there's prophecy there that you tie to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, of the process that they would use to confirm that a leper was cleansed. But check this out. Up until this point, the priests had never had to use a process that's prescribed there to confirm that a leper has been cleansed. But that's going to change. And Jesus stretched out his hand, and notice this. He did what? He t- what did he do? He touched them. Wait a minute. People must have been, oh my goodness, look what he did. It's like today in church, oh, look who came to church today. Look at this person. Look at that person. And I'm not talking about how we dress. I changed three times today because one shirt got sweaty from walking around. The other one, I need to iron it. I couldn't come out looking like a slob, so I figured I got to take care of that. And then I, this is my favorite shirt, actually. I keep a lot of clothes up there in my little office here, okay? Books and clothes, okay, up there. And so I said, you know what? This shirt this shirt's very comfortable. It's a little hot up here today, so I'll wear this one. Nevertheless, we're not talking about clothes. We're talking about the condition of our heart. We come to church all banged up sometimes. Now, we can look shiny and nice and pretty and all that good stuff, but it's what's going on on the inside. And you might be thinking, you know what? God, he ain't, God don't want to touch me. I want to remind you today that Jesus doesn't get infected with what we got when he touches us. We get infected with what he's got, which is his love and his grace and his mercy. So you may have walked in here today with a whole bunch of leprosy type issues. Uh, You might be like a car found in the junkyard somewhere where you're all rusted and dirtied out. 
and you look like you're ready for the scrap heap. But you know what God sees? God sees a beautiful restoration project. Jesus stretched out His hand and He touched him. Now listen to this. I will, Jesus said. Because remember His question? If you will make me clean. What did Jesus say His answer? Circle it. I will. Now let me communicate this in the Greek language to you. This is beautiful, by the way. In other words, this is what Jesus is saying. With all my heart, I desire to clean you. With all my heart. Imagine that. See, some of you came in here going, oh boy, if I ask God for another forgiveness, if I ask God one more time, See, some of us, we believe, you know, second chances, he's the God of second chances, and then he's done. No, he's the God, not a God of second chances, he's the God, he's a God of unlimited chances, actually. Oh, but then you really don't love him. Listen, God knows how stunad we are, okay? Let's just, let's just be honest. He knows how ridiculous we are. He knows how, uh, how we procrastinate with him. But he knows we need restoration. He knows that is our greatest need. We don't need to be rich and powerful and popular. We need the King of kings and the Lord of lords who's the only one capable to restore our broken hearts and our broken lives to touch us. But we need to trust in His genuine, genuine restoration. His ability to finish the job. I will. In other words, He said to him, with all my heart, I will make you whole again. All of those wasted years that you've had. All of that outcast time, I will make you well. Now notice this. And immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. And when God heals of a physical ailment, on the outside, obviously, we see in the Bible, it's immediate. Now don't you wish some of those emotional struggles we have on the inside went the same way? Or some of those selfish components of our life would go the same way that's the time that takes part that that's the part that takes time rather that we must realize that god is working on our lives we have instant salvation if needed we might have an instant physical miracle but the character issues take time to work out so i asked one of my buddies who has a car in the car show today and actually his shop is across the street to lend me one of his tools that he uses most frequently as he's restoring cars. And here it is right here. Okay? And when they're sanded and buffing, uh, this could be used for a number of different things. There's a number of different fittings. Okay? You know, this drill is hooked up and it's going. You could hear from across the street. And I was watching him on Friday uh, restore some vehicles. He had this Jeep that came in all banged up. um, And he showed me the before pictures and then the after pictures. Um, and I was thinking, there was another car that I, I really like. It's, uh, it's, look at this Datsun here. Just put that picture up on the screen. Look at this one when they found it. Okay, all banged up and dirty weeds growing in the end. Where's the engine? Now look at, look at it restored. This was done by somebody else. Look at that one. Okay. Yeah, you see like Crossroads Church written on the side there. Drive side. I don't know. know. You've got to have vision. you got to have vision. And so God wants us to restore our lives, but we must realize that parts of that restoration is going to take time. And some of it's going to hurt a little bit. Because there are some rough edges that need to be worked out. Now don't point to your spouse or your children or your friends. Okay, when we say that. Point to yourself. There's issues in your life that take time to restore. they got to be worked out. they got to be buffed out. Prayerfully, you'll have people around you who love you even when you're not so lovable because they see the big picture. That's called being Christ-like, by the way. That's the epitome of maturity. Not degrees and how who can recite this and do that. It's being patient with people who who need restoration because we have all needed restoration at one. We still need restoration, Amen? amen? And so genuine restoration requires us requires trust in Jesus' ability to do the finishing work, that he might save me, but for the rest of my life, he's still working on me. And he's still shaping me out. Because immediately he was healed, the leper, but he still had work to do. But we see this illustration of Jesus working this way in other places of examples of restoration. Notice what it says in Mark's Gospel. 
about the man who was blind. Now his friends, interestingly enough, begged Jesus to heal this man. It says, then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again, and his eyes were open. So Jesus again, touching, his finishing work. His sight was completely restored, and he could see everything clearly. Now, the first time Jesus touched this man, he asked him, now do you see anything? You know, he put up the eye shot, and the man says, well, I see, you know, people like trees moving. Now, it doesn't mean the healing was incomplete. It's an illustration that, you know, healing takes time in certain aspects. And then Jesus touches him again, and then everything he could see clearly. And then Jesus sent him away and say, you know, don't go back to, the, go back to your village, into the village, and go on your way to home. Jesus again working and healing and touching. His ability to touch. As you flip over your notes, in Luke chapter 9, verse 16, you might recall the person with the withered hand who came to Jesus on the Sabbath. So in Mark's Gospel, we have somebody whose friends had to take him, which means that you want to take your friends to church to get restoration. You want to take them to the Gospel so that they can find true restoration. Sometimes people don't want to come. We understand that. But you want to stand in the gap and show them where real restoration could come from. And then next we see here, it says, then Jesus said to his critics, because they didn't want him to heal on the Sabbath because they said it was a violation of the law. Jesus said, I have a question for you. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save a life or destroy it? He then looked around at them one by one and said to the man, hold out your hand. And so the man held out his hand and it was what? Restored. He's in the restoration business. At this, the enemies of Jesus were wild with rage and and began to discuss what to do with them. And I submit to you today, your enemies, your arch enemy, Satan, is with rage when you come to Jesus for restoration. He's fine when you don't go to church. He's fine when you don't go to Bible study. When you don't go to prayer meeting. When you find, when I, when I'll just put me in it. When I find a million excuses not to pray. When I find excuses not to read. When I find everything else that I could do. I have every time for everything else. But church, you know, if I get to it. You know what? The enemy don't care about that. He, he, okay, good. But the enemy cringes when you and I come to our knees in humble humility before God Almighty. When you and I stop buying the lie that we're too bad for God. That we're too rusted out, too mangled. Too many weeds going through the engine. The enemy wants you to believe those lies. But God wants you to know, I don't care if you're struggling mentally, physically, emotionally, relationally, or spiritually. You've come to the right place, the cross, because that's where God does His restoration business. And this man, with this leprosy, who was probably living in some colony somewhere, has missed countless birthdays if he had children, family gatherings, Maybe you, because you've made mistakes in your life, you may have missed a few things. But only God, not only can God restore your life, He could redeem the time ahead of you. And that is what's taking place here. But we got to come to God in prayer. A great verse to commit to memory, Psalm 80, verse 19, right there in your notes. Why don't we say this verse together? Restore us, Lord, God of armies. Make Your face shine on us so that we may be saved. This is a spiritual battle. The last thing your enemy wants for you, the devil, is for you to be in God's garage, by the way. You know, we might as well take out the front doors. By the way, do you like the new signs? Okay, praise God for those new signs. Imagine if we took out the front doors and we made it a garage door. Maybe we'll do that one day. If the Lord blesses us with this building one day and it's ours, and maybe in the building right next to us, maybe we'll make one of the entryways into the church a garage door to say, hey, come in here if you need a little work on your soul. Because God's got the right tools to do it. And this leper has walked into the greatest garage of all time. You know, this leper, think about leprosy again. I believe God is purposeful in allowing this to be the first one on record. This way nobody could go, I can't relate, because we can all relate to this. We can all, in one way or another, relate to the fact that we need restoration. Whether it's from a difficult life we've grown up in, whether it's from being tortured between our ears with troubles, whether it's from causing our own wrecks, whether it's from having some dinks and dents from other people, whatever it might be, 
God wants all of us to realize that He has the power to restore us. Because if He can restore a leper, He can restore you and I. But let's go a little bit deeper here. Write this last principle down. Genuine restoration provides opportunity for assignment. Could you write, can you say that with me? Genuine restoration provides opportunity for assignment. This leper wasn't just going to get his blessing. He was going to get some marching orders. They don't just restore a car to keep it in the garage. Now it's there to keep for safekeeping, but it comes out to show the beauty of what's been done. A lot of these vehicles, the hoods have popped up, and you can look in and see the engine. That's what God wants to do with you and I. He didn't just save us to keep us in the garage of the church. He wants to put us on the lane for everybody to see. He wants the hood up so people could see your heart to see what God has done, that He's transformed you and I from the inside out. That He's transformed the marriage. He's transformed the relationship. He's transformed the heart. He's transformed the life. Yes, you used to be defined by what you used to do. But that's been nailed to the cross because Christ has set you free. And genuine restoration now provides an opportunity. More than an obligation, an opportunity of assignment. It says, and Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. Now some of you might be going, what do you mean say nothing to anybody? Well, because Jesus wasn't looking to cause a look at me riot. Now we see that on TV today. We have faith healers on TV. I don't call them faith healers. I call those guys fake healers. Because for some reason, the guy you know, who has this you know, you know, $2,000 suit and, and the hair and everything like that, nothing against hair, by the way, but I'm just saying, you know, the perm and everything like that, they heal at, you know, at you know, 7 o'clock when the cameras and the lights are on. How come he doesn't heal at 3 in the morning when the cameraman's not there? Fair question, right? I'm being logical, right? Jesus isn't looking for fanfare. All glory belongs to God. My friends, God still heals today. I think one of the tactics of the enemy is to get these phonies to let people think, that's why people go, oh, you, you all know you believe in healing, all those people on TV throwing people down. Jesus is throwing nobody around. He's just touching people saying, I desire with all my heart to heal you. And he says the same thing to you and I today if you come to him, if you need healing. Don't be distracted by the hucksters and those who are trying to make a profit on people's pain. Trust in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anybody. But we do the opposite today. We're told, go tell everybody. We tell nobody. He's told to tell no one. He tells everybody. He did say this, show yourself to the priests and offer the gift that Moses commanded for proof to them. What's he talking about? Leviticus 13 and 14. Wow. Now think about Caiaphas, the high priest, and Annas. They had to, by all rights, declare that this man had leprosy. Because there was, and I don't have time to go into the full detail, but they had to go through an elaborate process. Basically, the law, the Bible, the first five books of the Bible, in particular Leviticus 13 and 14, could diagnose the fact that you had leprosy. That it's not chicken pox or measles or something. Something like that. You know, you come to the priest, you go, I got a couple spots here, and there was a process to determine leprosy. The law could, could only diagnose, but it couldn't cure. But Jesus came to cure that which couldn't be cured. And so, as this is unfolding, go show yourself to the priest. What were they thinking? Wait a minute. Here comes this man who had no fingertips. Who's got fingertips? Here comes this man who had no tip of a nose, who has the tip of a nose. Here comes this man. Why? Because the best person right now at this juncture in history to represent and authenticate what Jesus was saying about the law, about his power over the law, to fulfill the law and to bring healing is a man who had leprosy. This man had an assignment to represent his restoration. And he comes to Annas, and he comes to Caiaphas. What were they thinking? Because after that, there was an elaborate process that in, to, to now prove that he was healed that involved two doves. One to be sacrificed, the blood to be sprinkled, a bowl of living water, then to be poured out. What is that symbolic of? Let people say that Jesus isn't shown in the Old Testament. You have detailed prophecy, and then you uncover these truths. He's what? He's the living water. And by His blood, we are what? We 
are cleansed. David said, clean me with what? Hyssop in Psalm 51. What's hyssop? Hyssop was a cleaning agent that would be used. It was like a disinfectant. David said, clean me with hyssop. Guess what was used in this process to verify that a, a leper was cleansed? Hyssop. All of it ties together. It all points to the Messiah. And so this man was to go, and it said this, go and show them, he commanded, for a proof to them. For a proof to the same people who have condemned you. And so I share with you today, stop if you have received restoration. Stop believing the lies and living life under the covers, under the bed, in the closet, or in the garage. You come out and you show proof of your restoration to your accusers and to your enemy. Because God has an assignment for you. He has an assignment for you to live. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus with good works He prepared long ago. So let the enemies of your life, the voices in your head that want to drag you down, and the lies that come from the pits of hell be silenced by what Christ has said and done for you. God wants you and I to know that He's in the restoration business. I close with this story. It's about a boy who talks about how his parents had promised him a car when he would hit 16. He even planned to park the car in the family barn because we wanted to get a nice one and keep it warm and secure from inclement weather. The only problem was his dad had this old car parked in the barn and it was under this tarp. And he was waiting for his dad to haul it off to the dump because from what he remembers from seeing it, it was nothing but a piece of junk. A real jalopy in his estimation. But he thought, when would that day come? When would my new car arrive, he thought. When would the tarp be taken off and my car would occupy the barn? And then one evening... In the summer, he heard strange, loud sounds coming from the barn. And he saw the light on. And he went over there. And as he approached closer and closer, he could hear tools clanking and the sound of machinery. And he looked in, and as he came, the tarp, as big as it was over the car, was all over there. And he thought at first it was great. Dad got rid of that old garbage. And then he looked. And there, at first, he thought was in the place of the broken down car was this beautiful candy apple red sports car. A Corvette 327 V8 with a split window, aluminum knockoff wheels, sitting there. That was underneath that tarp for all those years. And then he remembers that he would hear sounds coming out of that barn, but he didn't exactly know what it was at night when he would go to bed. It was always there. It was just getting ready for him. And so his dad peeked his head up above the hood. And he said, son, why don't you come over here? I've been working on this car for you. Come on, grab a tool, and let's get this car ready. My friends, God has an assignment for you. It's twofold. One, it's for you and I, with the help of God, to work on ourselves. Let's stop fixing everybody. I think we saw that this week on the news once again play out. Everybody wants to fix every. Everybody knows everything. If we would just zip it and come on our knees and seek the face of God, things would change drastically in America. we got to call on the name of the Lord. Like David. David at first, David, he was caught up. I, you know, hates those who hate, oppose God. But then he says, Lord, search me and see if there's anything wicked in my own life. Assignment number one, as you leave today before you go enjoy the car show. Assignment number one, God in faith. I want to follow you so you can work on me. Assignment number two, let me spend the rest of my life 
showing the genuine restoration that the genuine Savior, Jesus Christ, has given to me. And then one day when I get to heaven, maybe you could pull out your sunglasses because you're going to need them there. It's going to be so bright. Maybe Jesus will have some sunglasses on and he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant that has been restored by my mercy and grace because of the cross and the empty tomb. If you believe that, say amen. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you that by your grace we are saved. According to your rich mercy, you have lavished us with love. You have healed all the dinks and dents. You've given us new tires to ride out on to proclaim your message. You've even went under the hood and fixed what was wrong deep within our own hearts. We thank you for the restoration that you give. Thank you for the privilege of going from the scrap heap to the car show for you. And we pray as all these hundreds of people are walking around the lane today, that they would know too, without a shadow of a doubt. Lord, draw them, O God, to the cross. May all people know what well to drink from. May all of us know, O God, that religion cannot restore us, but you can. May all of us walk in the newness of life. And may these truths of the Scriptures, these promises of restoration, silence the voices in our head, the criticism that comes from the pits of hell. And may we walk and live according to Your truth. We give You all the thanks and praise for giving us a spot in Your garage. Thank You, O God, for Your restoration. We sow these prayers. And thanksgiving for the great mechanic. We thank you, O Lord. And we sow these prayers in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.